<laughs> Dude, well, good to see you, man. How this you been? I like the hair. You know what? This is like a, a huge accomplishment for me. I've been nervous. <laughs> All weekend, I knew I was had to meet with you, and I'm like, and I, I told my girl, uh, I was like, she, he wants to do it over Zoom, and she goes, oh, no. <laughs> and she, she, she's extremely proficient in all this but she lives in ohio and she's like i'm like i can do it right she's like i think so but i, <laughs> I don't know I, i'll walk you through it but i didn't i didn't want to make her do that so yeah right, you have, just proved her wrong i love it dude what's well, good to see you again man good brandon lee you. yeah what's nashville's up, rock dude same old man welcome to nashville tennessee i guess via in a zoom kind of way i but wanted to get you on the show because uh obviously last week you guys dropped the welcome home the astronauts 20th anniversary i guess we'll call it the 20th anniversary it's the original version obviously but um but it came out and i put it on my blog and i was spinning some of the songs on my show and i thought it'd be cool just to reach out to you and see if brandon wanted to come on the show so i appreciate you taking the time man all the way yeah. are you still in texas right now or i am in i, I live on the face of the sun which is texas <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And right now we're actually getting rain from the hurricane that that is hitting uh, the Gulf or whatever. So we're getting, yeah, we're getting a little bit of that. But but yeah, no, I'm still in Texas in in sweet funky town, Fort Worth. Yeah. All, all those who don't know what funky town means, it's Fort Worth. I love that. I've been, I remember the old days of playing Lola's with you guys, man. That was always my favorite place. Lola's and the Aardvark. Are those venues still there? Aardvark is not. Aardvark's been been defunct a while now. Uh, Lola's, I actually do sound at sometimes. I work. At oh, Lola's nice. Today. Uh, I work on the, uh, live production side of it now as well. So I get across the aisle as, as Tim Locke used to say, <laughs> I love that. Well, dude, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's the, if I've gone from the Sith to the, to the other side, or if it's gone from the other side to the Sith, but all I know yeah. is that this side, they work, they work. I knew they worked hard when you, you know, when you're playing, you see all the tech guys and crew guys for the big videos. You're like, Dude, those guys work their asses off. Yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea. <laughs> so I do now. Yeah, it's so true, man. Well, yeah. congrats on the re-release. I guess we should probably start by going yeah. back. So, I mean, 20 yeah. years ago, the record came out. I actually worked at um, a Sam Goody when that record dropped. And I remember getting like the big cardboard cutout we set up for you guys because you guys right. had just came off of the show Bands on the Run. I wanted to ask you uh, at that time, the record comes out. Obviously, you guys were on a sold out tour. I've always wanted to ask you this question. Bands on the Run started airing in like the summer of 2001. And uh, at what point did you realize, because it's before social media and all that, uh, yeah. at what point in time did you realize, holy shit, this show is like catching on because you guys were selling out oh, shows I pretty tell, quick. I can tell you exactly when, and it, cause it's, well, it, uh, the show started airing. We filmed it right up until the end of the year, October through, I think uh, almost New Year's Eve. Anyway, it aired on April Fool's Day, but you know, it took, Two years, you know, it's a weekly thing, so it took a couple of weeks. But uh, our management started putting us out on tour uh, before, right before the show started airing. So we were out for like a week or two, and we were playing in Austin, which isn't far from us. And we we had a show opening up for SR seventy one, I think was the band. Oh yeah, I remember them right now. Oh yeah, and uh, and so this was after this was the week of the third episode of airing. Is so so there had been two on air two Sundays and then I think they replayed it once a week or something so but the after the first week we were all like you know we were on tour so we'd be in a group together and we were walking around like nobody notices anything nobody this is weird I guess it doesn't work it's all bullshit (laughs) and um but then the the third week when we were in Austin and we were walking from wherever we were eating down to the venue with SR71 and we kept hearing, I kept hearing all these whispers, and then we started seeing fingers point, and and all the guys were kind of not paying attention, and I was like, what's going on here? And then I said, guys, 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 we're in the middle of 6th Street of Austin, right? And so I said, uh, hey, turn around. And so we all kind of stopped, and we turned around, and there was it, it seemed to us like there was just like hundreds of people that were all pointing at us, and then like <laughs> kind of starting to approach us, and we were like, and we, you know, First thing, you know, from Texas, first thing we think was we're about to get jumped. We're like, like <laughs> we're all like, dude, what? who said something? Like, what the fuck? They're like, hey, y- y'all are those guys. Y'all are those guys. And so, <laughs> so literally, like, we, we started walking faster to the venue, and the crowd started walking faster to us. And then people started coming from the side streets. They're like, that's the band. That's that drunk band. <laughs> and so SR71 hadn't gone on yet. We were opening, obviously. And uh, 
we didn't expect to bring anybody. I mean, maybe a couple people that knew us from Austin, maybe. And I yeah. don't know. They didn't really have a, a big draw. I think it was like on a Sunday after the because the show aired on a Sunday. So when we left the venue, there was like two or three people there. But when we came back, we went to the backstage door and all of a sudden they didn't really go into the show at first. Everybody just stood at the windows and were like looking at us. And we were just we all were backstage and like we were like, dude, I think this just happened. Yeah. Like, I think I think this is for real because I don't know. <laughs> I know three people in Austin. Yeah. And, and after that, literally from that third Ep or third night the 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 night of the third episode and then for the next god 10 years but especially that that year and, and the couple after it was it's a weird it's a weird thing that you don't i never i never thought of the downsides of 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 having your you know because there are a lot of bands that are not really recognizable so much maybe the one or two guys are but yeah once they leave their venue unless they're like massive superstars it's like the videos and stuff unless you're a real fan it's hard to recognize somebody everywhere all the time right yeah well because we were on that show it really was like everywhere all the time and and it's that's a scary terrifying thing if it happens to you it really is it's not always fun because you know you can't ever turn it off and like yeah you can't all of a sudden we've noticed that you know you can't go to bars by yourself in another city or town it's i mean you can but it's there's there's people out there that just want to they just want to mess with you and then it was yeah. good or if you just yeah. you're having like a bad day you're on the phone you know your girlfriend's screaming at you or something and, and like people don't they don't care at all what you're doing they do they do not care it's like your time is mine i'm gonna come up and talk to you and this will happen everywhere everywhere you'll be at a flying j in nebraska and people will be like you're that dude <laughs> no matter what you're doing and you're like oh shit and so <laughs> it's as weird as it was and as and as fun and to experience it as it was, it was also eye-opening to like there's a reason why really, really, really famous people like have bodyguards and go in secret entrances and all that shit. It's it, it is for safety, but it's also just because like people don't care. They don't, man. It's like yeah. all of a sudden it's like, dude, whatever you're doing, I don't care. Talk to me. Here's my <laughs> wife. Say, say hi to my wife on the phone. Leave my wife a message. Like, oh what and if you don't if you don't jump right to it and even if you do really 80 percent chance that they'll say you're a dick yeah oh i, I could see that totally it'd be the not i even tried uh, like like social experiments with this because i was so puzzled of why why it, uh, half the time or more than half the time if your buddy meets a celebrity or a, a famous kind of band they always come back with the possibilities always yeah man i met that dude at blah 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 yeah he's kind of a dick like that's, <laughs> that's most of the time. Sometimes yeah. we're like, oh, he's real cool. So then uh, when people would come up and, 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 and say they wanted to meet me or something, I told my girlfriend at the time, I said, I'm going to be so overly nice. I'm going to be the nicest person possible, like where it's almost gross. It's like, <laughs> and, and, and I don't care if they want my attention. I, I don't care what I've got to do. I'm going to postpone it. I'm going to, I'm going to fulfill everything cross all the, you know, get an A plus in my book of the most, hospitable person that they'll ever meet in their lives that that they, <laughs> and still and still because what, what would happen is i would do all this and then they would go back to their table or their friends and then my girlfriend would kind of sneak around over the table and listen to what they just they were saying and, <laughs> and a few times a few times it was like they, they're like yeah man, yeah he's all right he's kind of a dick though and i'm like <laughs> i'm like there's no way out there's no way out yeah you know? You, you, you could be as nice as possible and they'll still go, oh, yeah, you know, dude, he talks so cool or something like that. You're like, oh, fuck it, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, and do you feel like with a, with a kind of level of fame like that from a TV show, especially at that time, and I think some people don't realize even to this day that, you know, you guys were, it wasn't like, cause now everything is like American Idol and we see so many shows like that. But yeah. You guys like wrote your own song. Territory. Yeah. Well, yeah. And also the way are, it was looked at was not exactly the most excusable decision to do like yeah. now now i mean people bands were like yeah put me on whatever show. it doesn't matter like there's no well like back because i'm old when we started bands you and i probably like if you were also in a cover band you got shit for that yeah like 25 years ago i was like you're in a cover band dude get out of cover what are you doing yeah like, you're not a rim musician you can't, you <laughs> yeah can't, exactly you can't be in a cover band and be in a serious band <laughs> like that was a huge 
they're like kids these days they're they, they hear that and they're like that's so stupid i'm like it, yeah it kind of was but we, we were serious about it you couldn't break that light it's like dude you got to quit that cover band if you're going to be in our band. <laughs> yeah. So the TV show is kind of like that where we were, it was so new that when we got on it, it was, yeah, it was easy for, here's what most bands said though. They would be like, yeah, dude, y'all are sellouts, man. Y- y'all got on the TV show. That's the only reason why anybody likes y'all, but, but I was pulling for y'all. I mean, it was cool. I, you know, I kinda liked it. <laughs> and, and the ones that were real assholes, I'd be like, dude, I have your audition tape. Cause like the, the producers, yeah. producers let us see a lot of the audition tapes that were like at a DFW. And we're like, that is hilarious. These dudes told us we were sellouts and we have their <laughs> audition tape. It's like, all right, bro, whatever. But we were aware of that. But about what you said about the, the re-release or the release of astronauts, Andy, I never thought, we did a release for this damn album. It was called 2001. <laughs> I, I never, if you told me in 2001, like, hey, man, guess what? Y'all got to do this again <laughs> because it's going to be lost for 18 of 20 years. And, yeah. then, and then for some reason, after the world's about, you know, imploded on itself, y'all are going to get to do all of this again. You don't even have to make a new record. <laughs> you're going to have, you're going to re release the same album to pr- pretty much the same people it acts like it's <laughs> never happened like yeah come on woo, we did it we did it yeah it's like groundhog day it's happening all over again <laughs> yeah, i have no idea yeah where was where was the record was that ever found out where the actual masters went okay uh i you know i wish i had the answer for all these questions i do because i should now all i know is this is that when we left um we left epic after 9-11 uh they didn't drop us they shelved the record everything stopped um we were on our we had released two of four singles which the third one being coke was supposed to be the the, the one that tested the most blah 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 that they yeah they made us change one of the lyrics and they were just betting all the farm on that and that was supposed to be released in october and so we had already charted uh 14 i think was uh was beautiful smile was the first one and then coke was coming and it didn't happen so they were dropping a lot of people. They kept us, but they dropped our a r which is Pete Robinson, who'd signed, um, I believe he signed Dave Matthews to RCA. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was a big a r guy that had just gotten to Epic. Well, he was like, y'all aren't dropped, y'all aren't dropped. And we were like, well, what about the album? He's like, yeah, I don't know. And then we got a call that said, uh, they let Pete go. And once, you're, once, you're, once your a r is gone from a big label, a massive label like that, no one knows. They, nobody wants. It's like, uh, 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 you know, like, don't look over there. They might try to get you to work with them, you know, like, so, <laughs> and so we, they said that they would give us another A&R guy, but they never, they never did it or it didn't happen. And so we left, we wanted to leave and we had a buyout in our, in our clause of, you know, take this chunk of money without the record or take half of that. And then you get to keep your masters, get to own the record. We chose the latter. We thought everything was cool. And then from what I was told is that not soon after that, when another label wanted to pick up astronauts and the, you know, however it came up, they were like, no, Sony says that y'all don't own it. And we were like, we have the paperwork that says we do. And Sony basically for a while said, do y'all. Wow. Like it was straight up. Like they know. Yeah. They were like, they were like do y'all, are you sure? <laughs> Well, you know, you're going to have to get some people to look into that because we have people that are going to look into that. It might take a while. Yeah. And so we were like, what does this mean? Like, they know we bought it back. And our lawyer at the time was like, doesn't matter. That's how, that's how this works sometimes. Cause yeah. And so that, that went on as far as I knew for uh, many, many, many years. And in the process, yeah. it never got duplicated again. We couldn't, we couldn't make it like it, it. We got a cease and desist or whatever. You know, like we had, we could not keep selling the record or putting it out. Oh, wow. And then they stopped making it and then even took it back from the, from wherever it was being sold at the stores. And then when iTunes and everything started to blow up where everybody started to buy stuff online and streaming by then, I mean, it was, it was gone. It was gone. Yeah. So for the last two decades, you know, there's a, there's been, you know, an album that everybody wants that 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 really couldn't be bought unless you bought it from somebody else that bought it in that year or two period that sold it on eBay or something like that. Like you could not 
buy it legally or, or you know, from wherever, from whatever platform. And let me tell you, that's a lot of royalty money. Yeah. You know, it's like somebody, you know, it's really like somebody taking, because us musicians, if you do have a record that is still, you know, I guess people will still buy years down the road, decades down the road. I mean, that's a huge deal. Yeah. It's passive income, I guess you'd call it. But absolutely. And, and, and then it was just like gone. And yeah. We did, we did that live album in Dallas that we didn't think would really be a big deal, but it ended up being the only way you could get those songs. So there's a, the causing a catastrophe live album is on a indie label uh, from Chicago called uh, what are records. And because astronauts has been basically disappeared uh, from the face of the earth, they've everybody that wanted that album bought the live album. So this, so this label in Chicago has been, seeing like steady sales for two decades <laughs> yeah but, but at a different rate and all that stuff where it's a fraction of what it would have been if it would have been epic right? yeah and so you know and then the band broke up uh you know not too long after that and then literally like i didn't know what to do like you know we had lawyers on it they kept saying it's just going to be you know drawn out in court and so i just kind of was like i guess it's gone and then um and then uh cory and our in our former manager that was the manager at the time this year uh Corey and paul bassman they they came back and said hey we've we've made some calls and like i don't even know the details to be honest but they said we we're able to re-release it now and yeah. i was like okay that sounds awesome <laughs> so do we have a release party again <laughs> yeah right and, and Corey was kind of like he's like in a, in a sense yeah because people are excited about it because it yeah. is true you know anybody that would run into one of us it, it, you know people we don't know people we do they're like why can't we buy the album like why can't i buy astronauts why can't i buy yeah. it for my friend why can't i download it youtube takes it down or gets you know whatever y'all don't own this like the video for beautiful is like if you try to play it on youtube or something it'll say you don't have the rights to play this or whatever and I'm oh, like, wow. I'm like, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, I sure do. <laughs> There's a face scan. I guess yeah. I do. See, <laughs> There's two people accredited on this song. and It's Lee Craig. <laughs> I'm Lee. Please. <laughs> and I see my own video, please. Yeah. That is so. a strange way of the old industry type. I mean, obviously that stuff still happens, but it was a weird time whenever labels were in so much Straight control. Gangster is what it was. Like literally. Yeah. And then, I mean, for Are you, you how it? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah and back right. in those days i mean what? you guys didn't have instagram or anything now it feels oh. like a bank can have a hit today and then you'd get a million followers and you can still kind of exist without the label but at that right. time man that had to kind of feel like what was that like for i've always wanted to ask you that too brandon what was that like for you whenever flicker stick broke up i believe it was 2009 when you guys yeah. finally called it how was it whenever if you were done with it and you put it away how was it going on not being brandon from flicker stick for a little while how was that well um yeah well the band the band finally called it quits yeah right at the end of 2009 um but i mean i guess your question is like what what do you post flicker stick life yeah i mean uh, how was it yeah how was it going from that to all of a sudden it's just not you're not playing in that band anymore well i you know the end part is true i wasn't playing in that band anymore but at, nobody else seemed to care <laughs> You, to, you know, 10 years passed since the band broke up and everybody that, you know, it's pretty general. Like, hey, that's Brandon. He's a singer of Flicker Stick. It's like, it might as well be my name before Brandon. That's the singer of Flicker Stick. I think his name is Brandon. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and of course, anybody under 30 is like, the what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny now, you know, getting older, is a, it's not it's not all it's cracked up to be. I mean, I, I like it. I've been in a midlife crisis for the last maybe nine years. I'm going for yeah. a record. I'm going to see how long <laughs> my midlife crisis might like eclipse the, 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 the early part of my years and the latter part of my years. <laughs> because like, you know, if I'm if I'm doing a show, whether it's front of house or with, a, you know, stage crew and there's a band that's 25 or 22 and they're setting up somebody now now it might even be one of their moms or their dads or somebody else that's they're like do you do y'all know who that is over there that's that's doing your monitors or whatever and and of course if i hear it i'd be like they're like <laughs> they're like no and uh and they're like that's that's uh that's a singer flicker stick and then four or five of them would be like 
okay, whatever. I don't know what that is. And then like one of them be like, my dad used to listen to you all the time. <laughs> you know, that, that old yeah. story. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't really like that. Cause you know, you don't want those kids. Cause I'd be one of them looking over like, I hope that doesn't happen. I don't want to run monitors when I'm, <laughs> when I'm 70, when I'm 72 years old, I hope I'm not running monitors. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> have you seen the uh the david lee roth video speaking of things like that david lee roth no, is in a I hotel won't room watch it because i'm terrified <laughs> well, a couple years watch. ago he was in a hotel room and uh i guess the kids and there was like a party next door to him and they were blasting oh, no. panama and so he's like oh, holy really? shit He's like, we got to go over there and surprise him. So he goes over there and bangs on the door. All these frat boys open up the door. They're blaring Panama. And he's like, what's up? And they're like, how's it going? No one recognized him. Oh, were they like, we're sorry. We'll turn it down, sir. Literally, yeah. And he looks really okay, like, okay, devastated. I'll, I'll, watch, I'll watch that. But like, yeah. I don't, some of the David Lee Ross stuff, I'm just like. Uh, oh, yeah. It's hard to watch. It's a weird thing, especially with vocalists like Vince Neil. And I was never a big hair metal fan anyway, but I loved Van Halen. But like yeah. that shit was hard to sing in the eighties. And like now, it, no matter how many keys you drop it down, it's still like, <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's yeah. hard for singers out there. Once you smoke your way into 67 years old, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Plus, it is know, so David, true. Man. David, David's always, I don't know. I've never really, I loved Van Halen despite David Lee Roth. I'll say that. But yeah. Whatever, that, that doesn't matter. Who cares? Oh Yeah. Whatever. No, absolutely. I've always liked Van Hagar too. They get a bad rep. I always thought Van Hagar was great. I you know? Okay. <laughs> With my hair, it's like it's like grayish blonde now. The speaking of Hagar, uh, the other day I I was coming out of a store and I swear to God this happened. There was the the there was a dude in a red Camaro, seventies Camaro, T tops, mullet. This is Texas. No sleeves, like chewing on T shirt. Jumps out of the car and he's going in the store as I'm coming out and he goes. What's up, Hagar? It's like it just walks into the store, and I was like, "Did I just get called Hagar?" Like, that's really? incredible. Sammy fucking hey, I look like Sammy Hagar. Okay. I've never got that before. I swear, God, dude, he did. And then he comes out of the store with his stuff, and he fucking hops in. This dude is like in his late sixties too. It was, it was the craziest thing. That's then, amazing. Yeah, I get called. What's up, Hagar? <laughs> anyway, I think I it's know. a huge compliment. I love that. So, dude, with uh, with the new release being out now on Spotify and all the streaming services, or, or the new re-release of Welcome Home, the Astronauts, um, I've seen a lot of the questions online. So, I, obviously, maybe you can't answer it, but I do want to ask it regardless. Is there a possibility so many people on your very strong fan base asking about a reunion show or a tour? Any chance of that ever happening? Seeing the original lineup of Flicker stick back together? You know, it is. It is. That question has gone on since literally the day after it broke up um at least yeah. for me but uh i'll say this i mean no as of as of right now there's no guarantee of that but if there was a possibility for something like that to happen i think that you know it we're definitely uh it's a hard question to, to answer because on one hand you know i can't say that there's definitely anything going to happen but i do i do feel that a lot of the guys Maybe not all, but a lot of the guys do. They're thinking about it. They really are because of all this. Really because of how much the crowd and the online chatter and and, and kind of the the bullying. I think bullying works in this case. So yeah, I think the fans <laughs> should keep bullying, please. <laughs> so bully, yeah. bully on, and it might work. But you know, some of the guys that are like, I don't know, they you know just just keep on their ass, and they'll probably be like. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, and it's good to see everybody's on speaking terms too. That's good. Most of us are. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean everybody's everybody's cool with each other now. Um, you know, some some guys don't really want to be involved in in well, you know, not everybody wants to be involved in this in a way where it's, you know, I don't know. I guess it's to, to each their own, but yeah, most of the guys are, we all talk, uh, even, uh, Corey and I, who had our problems in the past for the first time in 15 years, we are on a, on a, on a good, good playing field, like a good, yeah. everything seems to be going well. And, uh, you know, I think once you, uh, you know, once you're, once you're 46 and you're like, if something happened to me tomorrow, you know, people be like, oh, well, he's getting older, you know, like, so you're, just, you're to that <laughs> point where you're like, 
Um, no, I'm not going to be pissed off about shit that happened 14 years ago anymore right now. I just don't have it in me. I mean, and I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think a lot of the guys do. I think they're over that now. I think yeah. we're more concerned about like, what's our healthcare provider going to be like, you know, like, <laughs> literally, yeah. it's, it's, been, it's terrible. Like I, saw, <laughs> I, I talked to Fletcher today. I saw Fletcher today and I don't see him all the time, but he's my brother and we live in the same city, but sometimes we see each other. And today happened to be one of them. And he was, it was hot and he was sweating, eating the spicy food. And his wife was like, Fletcher, are you okay? And I always worked up. <laughs> and Fletcher's like, oh, yeah. I'm just, uh, uh. And then I said, as I'm leaving, I'm like, bye, Fletch. I, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back to work. And uh, I said, by the way, I've got one of those uh, digital electronic uh, blood pressure machines. <laughs> like, And he goes, I've already got two of those, Brandon. <laughs> and, and I just found one like in a garage sale that never been opened. So I was like, you know. I never yeah. would have thought about buying this item 10 years ago, but I'm like, ooh, that's $5. Even, <laughs> even, I, you know, I just want to test myself even though I don't feel bad. If Fletcher's like, yeah. oh, we got two of those, dude. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, that's uh, the, the concern is, is I guess, just priorities have changed. I mean, I, 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 I've never, I never stopped, really. You know, I've always wanted to, to keep playing as much as I could. But, uh, but I'll tell you this. Um, you know, our story is a strange one, especially the 9-11, but it was also the, when we, when we came into, I guess, you know, the, I hate to say like the, when we hit it big or something, cause I don't, I don't look at it that way, but when attention came or we merged into attention in 2001, that was right after Napster, right? So that was when you had everybody that knew anything about anything just, or just smart people in general, they all knew something was about to happen. They all knew a big change was coming. Yeah. Nobody, no one, nobody knew what was going to happen, like what we were going to do about it, what the music industry, how they were going to react. And I was not one of those smart people. Uh, I was, I, I just was like, we were so used to the whole, hey, we just got signed to a big label. So they'll figure it out, you know, like. Yeah. And so when they didn't figure it out, when the whole industry, it's still to this day, are still it's still kind of like a uh, but yeah yeah but that was a big like when 2001 when our when the when the the original release happened like that's when the everything was starting to change like i remember after two tours like people were talking about 360 deals when we got home and we were like what is that like yeah we didn't know what that was like it was a new kind of thing that was starting to everybody was doing 360 deals y'all should do one we're like i don't even we don't even know if we still have a deal right now, but, but, <laughs> but then it was, you know, then it was like, that was years before social media. And then as soon as streaming and social media, it's like, you know, now it's just, it's such a different animal. It, it might as well, the release of the, the industry, the way it was in 2000, when we signed the deal 2001, like talking about it right now, you might as well be like, <laughs> like that's how far, of a difference it feels like to me yeah like i don't oh, even i don't even know like i don't even know how it works i don't anymore it, what do you want yeah when it seems like nowadays it's so built around labels will wait until you're doing everything on your own and then they'll come and they'll try to sign you and then still not really offer you anything are so it's labels? like you're already kind of doing yeah i mean there are some i guess it always I mean, weirds me out when i see people sign to majors still I'm like really okay well, they should they should be weirded out they should be totally yeah. weirded out <laughs> Yeah, we, we, were, we were we were that naive band when we finally because we had a there was a bidding war there was a few major labels they passed on us for years and then yeah. all of a sudden like there was two or three that were like and we were like this is gonna happen wow and our and our management was like okay well it's really down to two and it's epic or this other big label that i won't name but um and he said y'all gotta make a decision we said all right give us time to think about it so we were playing at the tla in philly and it was sold out we were backstage and uh our management was there and they were like have y'all who are you gonna go with we have to do this y'all are about to sign a major label record deal like your dream thing is what everybody wants you got to pick one and so Corey yeah. and i he left and Corey goes pulls a quarter out of his pocket and he goes let's flip for it and no I was way like, i swear to god it's just Corey and i backstage and Corey goes, I mean, we both know the pros and cons of each one of them, but they want to know we, we got to make it. 
decision, Brandon. Because we really, both he and I, we were like, both, either one could be incredibly beneficial or, you know, totally could screw us. So what, what are we going to do? And he goes, boop. And it was the other label. And he goes, that's two out of three. And I'm like, <laughs> sure, why not? And so two out of three was epic. And so uh, uh, the intro music was starting and we walked by our management and Corey gave him the quarter and he goes, so what do y'all, did y'all make a decision? And Corey goes, we flipped for it. Epic's going to be our, our label. And our management. That is like, incredible. We flipped a coin. <laughs> and we were like, we couldn't make a decision. So yeah, we flipped a coin and we, we, we took Epic, but uh, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not even going to waste time dogging major labels because I don't even know how relevant they still are. Yeah. I don't. I mean, I hear, you know, from what I hear from the, the, the banter and the chatter from the, the 22, 23 year olds, they, they all, they all seem to think that you don't need a label. They're like, you don't need yeah. a label. You don't need a label. I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, well, oh, in that case. <laughs> yeah, right. Off, to, off we go. It does yeah. seem like it's kind of a thing that holds more people back than it helps these days, which is strange because, like you said, coming up when you and I were coming up, that was the goal was to get on a big indie or a big yeah. major. That was the goal. Well, and, and and also that you know, and then the press put out Flickerstick signs million dollar major label record deal or, or multi million dollar major label record deal. Well, on paper, yeah, it is, but it's not really what goes on. I mean, we didn't get a signing bonus or anything like that, but if you add up all the stuff that they could possibly do for you it's not, yeah. it doesn't mean that they will but if you add up all the possibilities yeah it could be multi-million dollar record level or record yeah deal. like we had eighty thousand dollars of tour support in our contract oh, while, wow. we, while we were touring on our own dime selling out you know thousand capacity venues and so we didn't we didn't ask and they didn't give us any for a while and then the cranberries asked us to be their sole direct support for their U.S. Canada tour in, in I guess, 04 or 03. And, yeah. Uh, or, I, mean, I don't know. Man, my years are bad. Anyway, uh, we were with Epic, and um, and uh, so we said, hey, you know, if we're going to do the entire U.S. Canada tour, you know, we're going to have to have a bus because they got seven buses. We got to keep up with them. And, uh, but, you know, we can't afford it. Like, on they don't, openers don't make that much money unless you sell a lot of merch. And so yeah. we were like, ah, we got eighty thousand dollars tour support. We're good. So we asked the label. We said, can we have some of the tour support? Uh, the first shows at in, in Montreal were Montreal Canadiens, like the stadium. They yeah, stadiums before. You know, first, <laughs> first show is is, is Montreal Canadian Center or whatever, uh, where the Maple Leafs play. I think that's right. Anyway, they said, uh, uh, yeah, and they gave us one thousand dollars. Oh wow! <laughs> that a bus is a thousand dollars a day. Yeah, it, literally. You know how long does it take to get to Fort Worth to Montreal? <laughs> we're like, we're going to be out of money by Nashville. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, well, it's, you know, our, our management was having to say, like, he was like, well, it does say in the country, it's their option. Everything is either wow. your option or their option. So it's all the stuff that you got. Everybody's like, y'all got a multi million dollar record deal. I'm like, yeah, most of it's their option. <laughs> yeah their option to give you the multi-million dollars that's so true <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean like uh we did the first original astronauts i think the total price start to finish was like ten thousand dollars for oh, the wow. whole whole thing we released it on our own 226 records and uh which drowning pool was the only other band that was on 226 records because it's the last yeah. two digits of the Z deep Ellum zip code i love that so, uh, but uh, $10,000, we got signed to Epic and to remix five songs with Tom Lord Algae was 85,000. Oh, wow. Thousand dollars. That's remix crazy. Five songs, yeah. A hundred thousand dollars. And he only That's remixed four, four or five of four of the five because the last day that, and he mixes in this uh, hotel in, in, uh, in Miami, like, like literally a, uh, not on ocean drive, but like, I think the street behind it, I'm, I won't give the exact address. He mixes in a hotel because it's it's just a mixing studio. It's not like ISO rooms. It's just yeah. the, the mixing part. And it's it's nice. But I was like, he's in a hotel? And it, <laughs> but it's, it's in Miami. It's like a very art deco, cool hotel and stuff. And uh, yeah. But on the uh, on the fifth day that, that Corey and I were coming in to work with him, we didn't work with him. He said, today we're doing what track? This one? All right. Y'all go do whatever it is you do. Be back by four, and then I'll let you listen to what I did, and then I'll tell you why you're wrong if you want to change it. 
You know, <laughs> literally. <laughs> but he was a cool guy. That's but he, literally, he would say that. He'd go, oh, we'll listen to it at the end. And then, like, you know, if y'all have some things that you might want, I'll tell you why they shouldn't be like that. And uh, But the fifth day we went in there, they said, oh, uh, sorry, guys. We tried to get a hold of you. But uh, Tom's dad passed away. So he's on a plane back to New York. And oh, wow. That was it. So. Yeah. But. Uh, no, it's so different before. now. You're right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, 80, 80 grand, almost $100,000. That's insane. $10,000 for the whole record, you know. And now people make records in their basements and like wherever they want, it seems like more. Even big studios are kind of in trouble in the same situation, you know. Here, here's 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 the real, when it really hit me in in the in balls of the of how things are different. And, and this isn't a negative thing. It started out, I have to make myself realize like I'm not a boomer and I don't need to act all like, oh, back in my day. So one of my <laughs> jobs has been at the university here in Fort Worth, TCU. They have like an open mic night for students thing once a week that I was one of two crew members uh, to like put on the stage and all the stuff. And then they sign up. There's like four acts every week. And then they do their open mic thing. Everybody gets 15 minutes. Well, uh, this was a year ago when it started. And we would have DI set up for keyboards, acoustic guitars, anything that you would use in open mic setting. Yeah. And for the first three weeks, there, that means there's four or five acts a night, first 12 acts or so. They just brought their laptops or their phones to us. Oh, you know, wow. There was one instrument, and I'm not saying it's bad, but at first I was like, why are we even set up? You know, <laughs> there's, not instru there's no instruments. And at first, yeah. but I didn't understand what they were. I didn't really get what it was that was going on. At first, I thought they were just kind of doing karaoke. Some of them yeah. were, but they weren't. A lot of them weren't. And this, yeah. is what it, this is what it taught me as somebody born in the Ford administration is that at first I was like, well, you know, there some of these are their own tracks. And I was, I was, that was not even giving them enough credit. A lot of this they did in their dorm the night before or that morning produced a new song. Oh, wow. They, they, you know, it sounded like a song. Like, That's and, crazy. And then, and then they sang over it or, or they had no lyrics and then it sang it along to, what they created and some of them worked on it for a week or two, maybe even a month or two. Some of them were like, I did this about an hour ago. That's and, crazy. <laughs> and, and now most of them can't play any of the instruments. Yeah. And that's, and that's where, that's where the gap is. I think that, that some of us at a certain age don't realize and some yeah. criticize. And I'm like, okay, well, cause you got some of the old guys, my age that are like, well, they should know how to play if they're, if they're making the music, well, they should know how to play piano. They should know how to play guitar. They should not play drums, not just do this or, you know, you know, however they, they whatever, you know, uh, however they're doing it where I, I was about to say like Cubase or something, but you know, whatever they're using nowadays. Yeah. I, I was like, no, no, no. I get what you're saying, but that that's not really like the fact that like you can play guitar really well, but can you go into a studio and produce a song that's listenable in six hours from scratch. No, you can't because you don't know how to do all that shit. Yeah. These, but these kids, through their difference in, in technology, it's like they literally had nothing. And then a few hours later, they came to me with a song that I thought was done in a studio somewhere, you know, relatively yeah. hearing it. I'm like, you did this like since nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> the kid's like, yeah, dude, you know, I'm still working on it though. You know, what do you think of my beats or what do you think of the, the, the song? And I'd be like, you did all that in, in a couple hours. And they're like, yeah. Dude, like, you should have told them. That, that's art. That's art in itself. Though. Yeah. It's producing. Yeah. It is. You should have, you should have told him you knew a guy that would do a mix of it for 85 grand in a right. hotel. His name's Tom Lord. <laughs> well, you know, you know, who's blown up on YouTube is uh, you probably know the guy, Rick Beato. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he, well, Astronauts was done by Todd and Toby Pipes from the from Deep Blue Something in Dallas. Oh, but okay. When Epic got a hold of it, they, well, we had it remixed by Tom Lord Algae, but they also, we added a track, we changed chorus, we did some touch ups on some of the songs, like Smile got added, right? And, uh, yeah. And that was all Rick Beato, and he was not unknown, but he was not. Rick Beato with 2.5 million views a week, Rick Beato. I mean, he was a producer in Atlanta that, that our A&R knew. And so we, we basically were thrown to Rick Beato 
who's a very nice, gentle man, very knowledgeable wizard of all things music. And, yeah. And we were literally, this is a month or two after we went from dudes that were waiting tables, you know, do you want some ranch with this stuff to like, <laughs> like we can't walk down the street wherever we go. And then they threw us all in his studio with all this booze. And this poor man was like, <laughs> <laughs> is this that band from the tv show that's still <laughs> being aired like they're still it was only halfway done and he's like i watched what y'all did last night i don't remember anything from the show because every time we would see an episode we'd be like i don't remember any of this <laughs> literally we were like i think fletcher was like i didn't even know we were in memphis like it was that's it was, hilarious but he's blown up it. now and like uh we slept on his floor for a week and, and then he retooled the poor guy. He was like, come on guys, just please focus. And he'd be like, think about this. And he's like really working, doing what a producer does. He's great. And we're just like, what? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> and so now, you know, I watch, I watch him like weekly just cause it's, it's interesting to musicians and stuff. And, and I'm like, he doesn't even produce bands. He, this dude finally gets to be a huge producer. Like, yeah. And then like, YouTube, his YouTube channel is so has consumed. Yeah, I guess he makes a lot more. He's like, I don't produce bands anymore. I've been doing this. That's so crazy. My channel's all I do for the last four years. And I'm like, that's oh. amazing. Yeah, I mean, like it's great. And he just, you know, and I'm like, you have to have, I know you have to have content roll out like every week. And I'm like, yeah, dude, Rick, I know you got some crazy stories. You need to say something. We're re releasing <laughs> the album again. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We're heating it up it. for you. We're putting it back <laughs> in the oven. I love it. Well, Brandon, it's been an honor to have oh, you on the man. show, man. I appreciate you taking the time, dude. Whenever I reached out to you, man. yeah, you too, man. It's been way too long. For 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 a long time, you've been following us. I've been following your stuff in Nashville, and you know the the whole back and forth thing. And uh, I just want to say thank you. You know, you've always been. You've always you've you. I, I like knowing that Andy's always going to be like, dude, yeah, all right, let's do this. Come on, what's wrong with you guys? Come on, bring it back, yeah. Always, man. If you guys come to Nashville, let me know. It'd be fun to have you guys up at the I'm, studio and hang. I'm, I'm talking to, uh, there's a promoter in Nashville that wants me to come solo. Uh, oh, yeah. Pretty, pretty soon. I'm, I'm doing some one-offs in other cities. Like, I'm going to Milwaukee next month and Jersey in October. So, uh, until the rest of the guys, and hopefully, I don't know if we can ever – if we get that worked out, it'd be great. But if not, I'm still going to do solo stuff. But uh, I think I might be in Nashville in a month or two. So, Dude, well, let me know if you come here, man. Let's definitely grab some coffee or have you come to the studio and hang, man. I'd love that. Yeah, that'd be great. Is the exit in still there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, It's good. still here. Yeah, 12th they say that venue. Oh, yeah. 12th and Porter's gone, but uh, exit in's oh, still here, though. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> well, they do you have Brandon Lee? Yeah, I miss that place a lot. Dude, yeah. welcome home, the astronauts. Re release now, all the streaming services. Brandon, it's an honor, man. I'll get all this edited up and I'll tag right. you in it if I post it online and everything. Cool. You can leave out the, the uh, Brandon doesn't know how to work Zoom. <laughs> That'll be exclusive content. I'll cut it out for you, though. Yeah. <laughs> the, the astronauts was it the astronauts returns or whatever, the sequel. Return, I love return it. of the astronauts. <laughs> right, well, man. dude, it's so good seeing you, man. I will see you soon. Yeah, man. Thank you, Andy. For real. Yeah, for thank real. you.